A birthday or an anniversary? Brother Tolbert. Sonny Southern. Henry and Sandra, and this is a nice bunch. Somebody said Heather Campbell's here. Go. Where'd Sonny go? Yeah. Billy Burgess? Did you see Bill yesterday? Duke check. Um, Sister Gail, Gail Saunders, somebody said had a birthday. There she comes. She's coming. Somebody said Ken and Rita. Was it? I don't think that's true, is it? Ain't there's Bill Burgess, Ellen. This is a fine crew, right, Chump? Anybody else? Yeah, Jeff, Jeff had a birthday and then he was gone. This is your very first time visiting. Would you just hold your hand up? And our ushers will get some right here in the front. Fellas, we've got some in the back. Hold those hands up high. Help us out upstairs, down below. Any others right up here? If you'll fill out that visitor's card, it is perforated. If you'll rip it off, you keep the information of the church. We want your information. And put that in the offering bag as it comes by. Now listen, those who are visiting today, listen up. You eat for free. We have a dinner prepared, uh, our youth competition, luncheon, spaghetti, and all the sides. If there are any sides, I'm not even sure, but it's good spaghetti. And uh, you eat for free, so we'd love for you to be our guest today. Eat for free, love to get to know you and meet you, so stay with us if you would after service right over in our cafeteria uh, following the morning service. Any others visiting for the first time? Amen. Do you feel that fall weather? No. Neither did I. We're still praying. Get a songbook, stand together, and Ron's going to lead us in a number this morning. Page 248, just over in the glory land. Are you glad to see old brother Joe Talbert here? You said, did somebody say yes, sir? Yeah. Are you really glad to see brother Joe? Are you? <laughs> 
Will said, you got to prime him. Love Brother Joe and his ministry. We thank God for him. He is a blessing to us, and he's a special type of fella. Uh, we thank God for his ministry to our youth especially, I guess especially. He's just a good all-around preacher, and we're privileged to have him here today. Rare back and sing with all your heart. Just go over into glory land. Are you happy? Sing it. I will hope prepare where the saints come by. Just over in the glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side. Just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land. I'll join. And his glory share us over. Turn around and shake it with those round about you. Just over in the glory land. I'll join the happy angel band. Just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land. There with the mighty host I'll stand. The blood will wash strong, I will shout and sing over in the glory land. That whole time is true, Christ our Lord and King. Just over in the glory, sing it, just over in the glory land. I'll join the happy angel band. Are you on your way? Here we go. I am on my way to those mansions fair. Over in the glory land. There to sing God's praise and his glory share. Over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land. I'll join the happy angel band. Ushers to come will come for this morning's tithes and offerings as we sing this old song. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Joined in with Jesus as we travel for Oh, the family, sing the first verse. You will notice we say brother and sister around here. Why it's because we're all family and these folks are so dear. When one has a heart, then we all share. In this family so dear, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed. You sounded pretty.
do remember uh, Brother Danny Riles. Many of you knew Brother Danny passed away uh, this weekend, and so we want to remember him and his family in prayer. Uh, love Bob Larkin. This is uh, probably their last service with us, and we're going to ask him to pray this morning. today and this evening especially to recognize two servants of the Lord Jesus Christ and this church. I want Bob and Gina to come forward at this time. Come to the stage if they would.
Bob and Gina have attended here almost 30 years. Oh, man. Uh, Bob has been a trustee of this church over 20 years. Uh, school board member going on 19 years. Uh, how many you know Bob uh, coached our tic-tac-toe team here for about 12 years? Yeah. Uh, been an usher, Sunday school teacher. Can we even begin to list all the things Gina has done for this church? Can we? We can. Uh, Gina has run the kitchen for our youth competition fundraisers, uh, school fundraisers. There were many times I came here on Saturday night late to study, and her car would be parked right outside that cafeteria, and I'd peek my head in there, and it would be Gina and her mom and they'd be rolling up those egg rolls uh, yeah. uh, for one of our, our dinner. Um, uh, she has uh, helped during camp meeting. Uh, she's prepared. She served food. May I say, Gina's egg rolls will be greatly missed. Can I get an amen? Uh, Bob said that he and Gina will visit here periodically, and I have asked if I could get those dates in advance, and we'll make those Korean dinner days. How about that? Amen. Keep her working. Uh, but Gina has done so much uh, for this church and uh, this school behind the scenes that nobody knows about. Uh, she and Bob are true servants you, Lord. of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Bob has been a great friend and a valued trustee uh, at our church and at the school. Uh, and so we wanted to take this opportunity to recognize them both. Tonight we'll be having a, a, a dinner. I mean, it's not just going to be a little bit. It's going to be a lot of food. So we want, I know half of you are coming back to church tonight just because I said that. But it's in honor of them. We have cards for you to fill out. If you want to give money, give money. Uh, but uh, from the church and school, we, we went together. And uh, we have for, for Bob and Gina a, a monetary gift for them um, flowers, and there's a gift card as well somewhere there, Miss Gina. But uh, we also got a plaque, and this is what it, it says. It says, to Bob and Gina Larkin, in appreciation for your many years of faithful and committed service to yes, the sir. members of the First Real Baptist Church and the students and teachers of Sefner Christian Academy, only heaven will reveal the number of lives Great you have impacted for the God. kingdom of God. We love yes. you. And at the bottom it says, well done, thou good and faithful yeah. servants. Would you join me in yeah. showing your appreciation for Bob and Jesus? And we invite you back tonight to uh, celebrate... Uh, their, their ministry here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm going to ask the trustee, Brian, to give this check to the other trustee, Bob, that we forgot to give to him just now.
Chapman, Brother Joe Tolbert. Uh, how many know it's Joe's birthday coming up? Do y'all know that? All right. Um, how many got invited to his birthday party last night? A couple of us. Uh, Joe, he, he looks like an adult, but he's not. Yeah. And for his birthday parties, he has a theme. And he likes dressing up like the characters. But he won't let anybody else do it. And so uh, this year's theme was Toy Story. And so for his birthday, Joe uh, had a birthday party. And we got a picture of the party uh, at the thing. And th there he is. There, there he is, dressed up like Woody. Look, he wouldn't even let Mandy and the kids dress up. And they got to wear T-shirts. But Joe wants to be the life of the party. No, I'm just yes. kidding. That was this year at the National. Uh, and he was a part of that. And the kids absolutely loved it. But we love Brother Joe. Would you give him a hand as he come to preach for us? This morning. He can preach himself. <laughs> oh, I knew that would come back and haunt me. Yes. I invite you to take your copy of the Word of God and go with me, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 5. That's where we'll be this morning. 1 Peter chapter 5, we'll read a familiar couple of verses, and then let's expound to what the Lord has to say for us this morning. Aren't you glad to be in church today? And church, let me just say, as you honor those that have faithfully served your ministry for years, you well done. Good job for doing that. The Bible says that we ought to give credit where credit is due. And so I think that's great that you do that. Not a lot of places would be willing to acknowledge good labors for kingdom work. And so you've done that. So good job, preacher. That's great. That's excellent. 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's begin in verse 8. Be sober, yeah. be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, your opponent in a lawsuit, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, swallow, make disappear, is the best translation there. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. By the way, can I just pause and say that because of our sober, because of our vigilant, that adversary, the devil that's coming after us, look, we can resist him. We do that steadfast in the what? Faith. Where does that faith come from? The Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But... The God of all grace who hath called us unto the eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that ye have suffered a while, make ye perfect or complete, establish, strengthen, settle you. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Some of my most favorite things to do in life is to play hide and seek. When's the last time you played hide and seek? You say, Brother Joe, that just sounds lame. You're lame. That is the funnest game. I mean, really, to play hide-and-seek is just, it's a blast. For real, when's the last time you played hide-and-seek? Some of you? Yesterday, 50 years ago, you know, when I lost my kid at the funeral home that one night and had to go play hide-and-go, true story, yeah. Well, yeah, hide, okay, so we know the premise of hide-and-seek, don't we? You hide and somebody comes to seek you. Now, I like to hide. I really, really do. And I'll tell you, the best hider is Mandy Lane Tolbert. She can hide like a can. Okay, so when, when we pastored in Alabama, we did a lock-in for our youth group one night. Had about 50 or so teenagers, and um, our youth leader was there. We were just going to have a really good time. And uh, I thought I could stay up all night with them, and I learned that that's just not possible anymore. But anyway, so we were going to play hide-and-go-seek. And so... Um, everybody went and hid. Mandy went and hid literally two and a half hours before they could find her. And she wasn't going to come out because th she wanted them to find her. Because, you know, the guys are like, oh, I'm going to find her, I'm going to find her. And I'm like, you go right on ahead and try to find her. And they couldn't. I, I like to hide, but I really, <laughs> I really like to seek. There's just something about incognito... Navy SEAL style crawl down, <laughs> seeking. I love to do it. And I especially like playing hide and go seek with littler kids that are easily to be frightened. <laughs> yeah! Just like I like to play football with preschoolers because I know I'll win. 
I love to play hide and go seek with little ones. Why? Because when the lights are out and you're playing in the dark, you can always go, oh, here I come. <laughs> and they may be hiding in the cabinets and they may be hiding in the shower stall and they may be hiding, but when they hear you go, oh, I'm coming for you. Especially if you do it like I do. I'm coming for you. <laughs> Cookie monster. Yum, 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 yum. <laughs> Freaks them out. Most of the time they'll come running out because they're too scared. <laughs> Can I tell you something this morning? The devil is coming after you. Yeah. He's coming for you. He's coming for your family. He's coming to disrupt. He's coming to distract. He is coming to discourage. He is coming for you. And look what the Bible says how he does it. As a what? Roaring lion. I always thought it's interesting that the writer, Peter, uses the term roaring lion. Why not a sneaky lion? But why not a uh, boisterous lion? Why not a lion that has more power than we have? Why couldn't he use that description? All those would be true. Why couldn't he use the description a lion like a wave that would overcome you or, 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 or that would attempt to have victory over you? Well, the truth of the matter is, is he's roaring because he's making a lot of noise. There's something about the vocal. There's something about the listening. There's something about the words that the devil loves to use to knock us down. The Bible says in Proverbs 23 and verse 7, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The devil is in a battle against your body physically. The devil is in a battle for your family. He wants to destroy the marriage institution. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy everything about the family. Uh, the devil is coming after you because you matter to God. That, that's the only reason he comes after you. He don't care about you. He don't care whether you writhe in hell. He don't care about your uh, disposition. He don't care about your disruption, your discouragement. He is only coming, seeking and roaring after you because it affects the very heart of God when he messes with his children. He's in the battle for the church. He's in the battle against truth and against righteousness. And my friend here at Plain and Simple this morning, he is in the battle of our mind. That's why he is a roaring lion. He is walking about seeking whom he may swallow or may disappear. And he does that by using words. Can I just note to you a few simple things if you get your paper out and your pen out and jot a few thoughts down with me this morning. How... He is coming after us. I think there are five central arguments. Take it as you will, but I think there are five central arguments that the devil seems to be coming after with us. And these are arguments that we know to be true, arguments that we stand on. But let me just remind you, not any new information, but let me just remind you where we stand when it comes to these. Number one, he is arguing the creation argument. He's been doing that from the time time began. The devil loves to roar that we uh, came from animals, that we have evolved over time, that there was a ooze that just kind of plopped up on land, and after it plopped up on land, it kind of decided to uh, grow feet, and then when it grew feet, it grew arms, and then it uh, grew a head, and then it grew a hairy chest, and, and here it was, this Neanderthal walking around, and, and this is what we have come out of. It is the idea of erasing anything and everything that has to do with God's great creation for man. Can I just remind you that the dear Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, uh, in the beginning God created, uh, uh, God created, God created, God created. There is nothing that has been created that has been by accident. It is all on purpose. And the roaring lion may say that there's no such thing as a creator. I'm here to remind you uh, uh, there is is something as a great creator uh, and he holds the world in his hands this morning hallelujah that's good stuff it is God that made us he made us using 58 pounds of oxygen 50 quarts of water 24 pounds of carbon two ounces of salt three pounds of calcium some chloride phosphate fat iron sulfur and glycerin in your body is 100 million receptacles just in one eye alone 
24,000 fibers in your ear that vibrate. You have over 500 muscles, over 200 bones. Your heart beats 36 million times a year. As it beats, it pumps 60,000 gallons of blood through 600,000 miles of vessels, arteries, and veins. Your lungs have 600 million pockets. Uh, you have five quarts of blood uh, with 22 trillion cells. Uh, each cell, there are millions and millions of molecules. Each of those molecules... Uh, an atom which oscillates uh, uh, 10 million times a second. Every second in your body, 2 million cells die and are replaced. You are made out of 31 pounds of gray matter. From the look of you, some may have more, some may have less, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, there are 4 million pain sensors, 500,000 touch detectors, uh, and 200,000 temperature gauges in your body. If we were to take a postcard size stamp, or excuse me, stamp uh, uh, on the thickness of the back of our hand, uh, it would be the thickness of a postcard. Uh, in it would be 3 million cells. I'm talking about just right here. Uh, uh, 3 million cells, 1 yard of blood vessels, 25 nerve endings, uh, uh, 4 yards of nerves, 100 sweat glands, uh, uh, 15 oil glands, uh, and God did it all with some dirt. Let me tell you something, my friend. We were not created by chance. Uh, uh, we were not created by a big boom. Uh, uh, we were not created just because something happened. Uh, uh, God orchestrated it all. Uh, hear me now. He orchestrated it all. Uh, it doesn't matter what the lion roars. Uh, I want to roar from the pulpit that God made, uh, and He purposed Purposed, and it was not by accident. It is easier to believe uh, that a dictionary was created by a paper explosion at a printing press uh, than it would be that God uh, had nothing to do with our creation. Look at yourself. Uh, your God made. Uh, God loves you. Uh, God cares for you. Uh, God wants to be a part of your life. Hallelujah. Uh, we are made by Almighty God this morning. Amen. Is not by accident but on purpose. The creation argument. He loves to debate the sexual argument. You say, Brother Joe, it's Sunday morning. Calm down. Hang on now. <laughs> the great argument of the sexual argument. Let me just say a few things that you may be aware of. The average young man that looks at pornography as of this past week is at the age of seven. The age of seven. Did you know that one out of every four men sitting in this room are involved in pornography and one out of every six ordained preacher is involved in pornography? Did you know that 40 cents out of every dollar that is spent in pornography is by a woman? Almost half by a woman. Let me just remind you, friend, that pornography is not just a mental thing. Even though some would try to justify it. And say that, hey, it's just all in my mind and what I'm looking at and, and what I'm dabbing in online or, or at that local bookstore, whatever it may be. Hey, that's not hurting anybody because it's just in my head. But uh, when God says, hey, if you even look at a woman with an adulterous spirit as this, if you have committed the very, very act itself... It is not just a mental thing, even though it's physical. Stop trying to justify it. That's how the roaring lion likes to roar. Hey, it's okay. You're not hurting anybody. You don't have to listen to God's standards when it comes to a purity and when it comes to pornography. Listen, pornography rots the soul and it changes you and you'll never be the same again. Here's a bottled water. I'm going to open the bottled water. Listen. I broke the seal. Now I'll close it back up and won't take a drink and it looks pretty good intact. But because I've opened it, it will never be the same yeah. again. You see, if you look at that stuff, you'll never be the same again. Hey, it's okay. Your wife is not pleasing you the way she ought to, so you go ahead and do that. That's a lie. Hey, 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 you're, you're getting at the age where you need to explore and, and you need to understand about these things. So let's go online and, and let's see what we really, really need to see. Listen, that's the way the roaring lion walketh about. He's looking to destroy you mentally, not just fellas, but ladies all together. Watch what you look at. Not only that, in the sexual argument, he wants to argue with our gender. In Genesis chapter 1, God created. God created. He is the creator. In Genesis chapter 2, He then gives us the command that He created male and female. Everybody got that? 
And he made male and female because they will go together hand on hand. He didn't make male and male and female and female. He instituted male and female. That's the relationship that's supposed to take place. Even nature itself teaches us that. I mean, it seems to be a common sense thing, but that's what the lion will roar. Hey, hey, you just feel what you got to feel. Hey, hey, if you don't think you need to go uh, with the opposite gender, then you go ahead and accept the things of the same gender. That is not God's way because in Genesis chapter 3, we now see depravity has entered into the cause. And as depravity entered into the cause, uh, uh, we see later on in chapter 3 that God reminds us that He has put a conscience in us. Uh, that conscience is to be a, a spiritual compass. By the way, the Holy Spirit of God works with that conscience and conviction and that after we come to Jesus, He works alongside that. And because we have uh, detainted that spiritual uh, compass within us, that is our conscience, we are defiled. We get to a place where we've seared that. Whatever happened to good old preaching behind the pulpit uh, and saying, listen, God... God created you uh, uh, for His glory, that it is for His glory. Isaiah chapter 40, it is for His glory. And a life out of sight that would reject that, but the lion roars. The lion roars for you to question your gender. Why do we question our gender? It is God's creation. It is God that assigned you what you are and how you are. Can I just simply say this? I'm going to clear myself off a place and I want you to hear it. When we question answers that have already been provided to us and the answers have already been provided to us and when we question them, the only thing we're doing is trying to eliminate the authority in our lives. It's the only reason why. Son, I don't want you to go across the street. Why? Darling girl, I don't need you to hang out with that. Why? We're questioning authority. Plain and simple, the pastor gets up and says, we're taking up a love offering for Brother Joe. Why? Don't question that. <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just kidding. Partially. <laughs> because we're questioning and we're trying to eliminate authority in our lives. When somebody doesn't, a male doesn't want to be female, say, Brother Joe, there are a documentation after documentation of the struggle. There is, but the truth is the struggle goes no more than what's inside the brain. It is never documented that it is anything physical. God does not make junk. He does not make confusion. He is not the author of confusion. That, that, that is not the way that God has designed that. And who we are is assigned by God. And I just don't want to add up to that authority of God. And by the way, I want to eliminate the authority. So how, why do I eliminate the authority in my life? Because I want to eliminate accountability. That's where it's at. It's about a word telling me that I'm going to be held accountable before God Almighty. And I don't like that. And I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And so what do I need to do? I need to subdue whatever authority is in my life when it comes to the Word of God so that I don't have to recompense that I'm going to have an accountable day before the Lord. Can I just remind you that 14% of suicides, it is a higher, 14% higher suicide rate amongst homosexuals than anybody else. And between 32.3, I don't know where the point three comes from, but 32.3 and 40% of transgender people will commit suicide. That's almost half. Yeah. The devil is roaring. You don't have to listen to God on purity. You don't have to listen to God on gender assignment or orientation or pornography. You don't have to listen to God when it comes to how to live a clean and pure life. You just do whatever you want to do, whatever you feel like, however you can be accepted, and that's okay. That's a lie. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he's coming after you. Brother Joe, I don't have homosexual tendencies. Great. Brother Joe, I don't struggle with pornography. Wonderful. But keep yourself pure in all areas. Amen. Not only that, we see the number three, will you jot it down, the alcohol argument. Lord, you're just hitting them all today, aren't we? Yeah. Well, let's just camp there just for a minute. When I pastored for years and years, that was the biggest struggle that we had. And I don't mean struggle because I struggled in it. I mean because I can't tell you how many times after preaching a message on total abstinence, which by the way is still where it's at, how folks would come up and say, well, how come the deacons over at First Baptist can do it and we can't? Right. I'm telling you the truth. Well, Brother Joe, I don't understand if, we're, if this is where we're supposed to stand, but it seems like everybody is like, see, that's the problem. You're keeping your eyes on the wrong that's thing. Right. 
You, you gotta, can't do that. The roaring lion wants you to look at what everybody else is doing. The roaring lion wants you to be convinced that God is holding some good from you. Because if you're convinced that God is holding some good from you, then guess what? You're going to go seek that good somewhere else. Because God no longer satisfies. And when God doesn't satisfy, you're going to go look around for wherever you can find that satisfaction. And can I tell you, outside of God, you will never find satisfaction. Hear me now? You'll never find satisfaction. It's all right because I drink responsibly. <laughs> That's an oxymoron. Drink responsibly. It's an oxymoron when somebody tells you, drive careful. No, I'm going to drive reckless. Well, of course you're going to drive careful. Responsibility is not drinking. It does not go hand in hand. I don't care if you don't like it. There is no such thing as drinking responsibly. You're irresponsible every time you do it. you got to stay away from it. Well, I'll just drink a little. It's okay. That's what the roaring lion says. As long as I don't get drunk, then I don't make God mad. Be careful. Be careful. When it comes to alcohol, my friend, we take a total abstinence stand. Why? Because of our Christian testimony. Did you know that alcohol is involved in 51.3% of all driving fatalities? Did you know that 50 million Americans are dependent on alcohol right now, right this morning? And the sad thing is, is that 500,000 of those are between the ages of 9 and 12 are dependent on alcohol. It is a $90 billion a year great business. Jesus never makes provision for the flesh. Ever. He will never, ever, ever justify us doing something of the flesh. Alcohol is a mind-altering drug. It counterdicts and it threatens what we value as Christians. Do you hear me? We are to live above reproach. We don't live perfectly, but we live above reproach. The word uh, above reproach means so that nothing would stick to us. So that an accusation can be thrown, but it doesn't stick to us. Because we live above reproach. That we want to be clean. That we are uh, discerning God's will for us when it comes to these modern times and these modern thoughts. Alcohol is addictive. Here's my most favorite argument that we consistently get. But Brother Joe, as long as it's in moderation, it's okay. All right. Then as long as I look at pornography only on Tuesdays in moderation, it's okay. As long as I have an affair on my wife only once a year, because that's moderation, it's okay. As long as I cuss in church only six times a month in moderation, it's okay. Preacher's guilty of that. I'm just kidding. Absolutely not. There is no justification for moder moderation. It is a ruin of our Christian testimony. It is a ruin of our Christian love. Don't be a stumbling block to others, to the weaker Christian. Amen. We know that. What a great argument. The Bible says that we choose to abstain. Why? Because we are making a social statement. We are saying, I boycott that because it hurts others. It may not be an issue for me, but it's an issue for a drunk dad that beats his kids every time he goes to it. I'm not going to give to that enterprise. I'm not going to support that enterprise. Bless God, we take a stand against alcohol. Amen. Roaring lion seeketh whom he may devour. It's okay. Dab a little in it. Hey, we're millennials. Hey, your generation Y, generation X. Hey, you did it when you were on the Titanic 509 years ago. Do it again. No. It damages the Christian conscience. Let me just make a few statements, and this is just me personally. I'm not your pastor, but I'll say it nonetheless. I personally would feel uneasy and guilty to use alcohol. How about you? If you have to do it in secret, my friend, there's a problem. I don't want my kids to be around. In fact, Mandy and I take a pretty strong stand about even the people that we allow in our lives because they may dabble in it socially. I've had to tell you that they don't spend a great deal of time with my parents because of that influence. And that's a sad thing, but I choose to protect them as long as I can from those things. I'm going to protect them at all costs. My kid may become an alcoholic, but that's because... 
He's justified in his mind by doing it because mom and dad did a little here and there. And that's not okay. I just want to keep them from it all together. Don't be so quick to liberate ourselves. That's what we like to do. We like to change our stance up on that. Brother Joel, that was okay when we lived in the 80s because it wasn't much of an issue. But now we're going to have to face it and so we're just going to have to accept some things. Listen, we are so quick to liberate ourselves from things that are so destructive. If they've always been destructive, they're still destructive today. That they're still damaging today. It doesn't change. The roaring lion seeking who made me devour. Hey, drink a little. It's all right. It's okay. God won't get mad. Get that many young people come up to Mandy all the time and say, Brother Joe, how much can we do this before it makes yes. God mad? If you have to ask that question, there's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. How much can I do this before God says, all right, enough is enough? God says it before it even begins, enough is enough. Here's the argument that he loves to roar about. What about the theological argument? What am I saying about the theological argument? I'm saying that, hey, there are many religions. Yeah. You don't have to do that Jesus the only way thing. That's crazy talk. No, we're amongst many, many others. And, and we got to be acceptant of everything like that. Hey, hey, Brother Joe, don't you think that it's okay that uh, uh, the Muslims that would practice their belief or the Mormons or, or, or the Jehovah Witness, don't you think because they are so vehement about their belief that that should count for something? It doesn't. I don't mean to be rude, but it doesn't. Just because I stand up here and argue that the walls are purple doesn't mean that the walls are purple. I can go home and convince, I can write six books and, and I can make a movie about the walls being purple and I can shout it from the house tops. I can crawl on the cross you got at the uh, top of the building and shout to all of Sefner that uh, the walls in this room are purple. Y'all go walk by and say, he is crazy as crazy can be. But I vehemently believe it. Isn't that good enough? No, it's not. My friend Jesus is not the same as other religions. In fact, it's Paul that says that you will mark those and disdain from them, literally get away from those that do not preach Christ and Him crucified. Be careful who you hang out with. Yeah, Brother Joe, we all believe in the same God. whoop de doo Be careful. Oh, Brother Joel, it's okay as long as we said this in Sunday school. I think it fits so well here. Spurgeon once said that discernment is not between right and wrong, but it's between right and almost right. Be careful. Be careful because the roaring lion, he loves to whisper it in your ear. Hey, it's okay. You go to that church, you just go ahead and go, and you go on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights. You get involved in the ministries there. And, and you go ahead and you listen to what they've got to say, but at the end of the day, hey, it's all inclusive. Can I tell you that heaven is an exclusive club? I don't mean club in the low sense. That the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. Always has been and always will be. When Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, I am the only way. That's dogmatic talking. That's exactly the way it is. It is not okay to step back and justify other ways. There are not many roads to God. There is only one way. He is not equal to other gods. He is the only God. Hallelujah. Number five, he loves to roar the tolerant argument. The tolerance argument always throws up in our face. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. Do not be judged or do not judge lest ye be judged. How many has heard that in like the last six months? Oh, yeah. Who are you to judge me? Yes. Well, you just be careful. Listen, listen. First of all, let's just clear this off right now. When anybody throws up verse 1 of chapter 7 in Matthew, throw up verse 2 to their face. Because verse 2 is not a contradiction to verse 1, but it is basically Jesus explaining, especially you go all the way to verse 13, that He's not forbidding us to make moral decisions or evaluations about things. He's telling us how to judge, but judge properly. Be careful how you judge, because you will be judged with the same judgment lest ye be given. And then he goes on to explain, hey, you make moral decisions every single day of life. You make judgments every single day of your life. You have already made about 625 decisions since 24 hours ago this time yesterday. Unbelievable, ain't it? 
You've decided if you want the covers on when you sleep or not the covers on. Am I going to turn up the air or am I going to leave it alone? What car are we going to drive when we go to church tomorrow? Because one's parked behind me. Should I move that car behind me? What are we going to have for breakfast? How many times am I going to eat that breakfast? If I had strawberries in my bowl, am I going to eat all of them? Am I going to eat four of them? Am I going to eat two of them? Am I going to dip them some? Am I going to cut them in half? I mean, there's a whole bunch of decisions right then and there. And you say, Brother Joe, the decision of rather or not I brush my teeth now or later has no bearing on my decision. It's the same judgment call. The exact same one. You are exercising a sense of judgment, and we do it every time. This verse teaches us on how to judge and how to judge properly. That's with the right attitude, that is with a humbling spirit, and that is lovingly, unashamed, confront the world and confront the flesh and the devil with the truth of what Jesus Christ has said and what the Word of God has said. The two greatest arguments that go against us as Christians that we're attacked against, number one is our belief in moral absolutes. Yeah. That there are no absolute truths. That we believe that God is creator, maybe. We believe that Jesus uh, is born of a virgin, perhaps. Well, we believe that they walked over on dry land with a Red Sea encounter, Maybe. No, we do because that's what the Word of God says. Amen. Church, hear me and hear me now. We stand on what thus saith the Word of God. Why is it so easy for us to compromise those things? Why is it so easy for us to sacrifice the things of this culture because of a wind of doctrine that may come by and whoosh us on somewhere else? I'm mad because I don't like the color carpet, so I go somewhere else. I'm mad because I don't like what the preacher preached, so I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm mad because God ain't doing what I think he ought to be doing. How he ought to be doing it is the way I hope for him to do, so I'm just going to go somewhere else. That's nothing more than a roaring lion. Our belief in moral absolutes, the lack of conforming to the goodness of God, but also, number two, our insistence that Jesus is the only way to salvation. Yeah. Consistently attacking our absolutes and our tolerance argument, hey, you can't judge. Hey, hey, some may be going the wrong way, but we're just going to justify that wrong way. No, 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 not at all. So I come down to all of that to say this. What do we do? I mean, if he's coming to get me, because he is. You say, Brother Joe, I'm sailing pretty good through life. Then you better look out. He's looking after you. Can I just clear my off self off a of place and just say a word or two if I can just for a moment? Do you know how he can do the most damage to this body of believers? By attacking this man right here. That's why it is prevalent that we pay for our pa pray for our pastor and his wife. He knows that if he takes down the leader, buddy, he's doing pretty good. Be diligent to support and to pray. But not only that, what should we do? Look at, if you will, right back at our verse. The scripture says what to do. Isn't it amazing how God's word always tells us yes. what to do? <laughs> hey, the lion may be roaring. He's pretty loud. But God's word says something great. Look right here. Be sober. I love the word sober. It means to be sound-minded. Yeah. We are to be clear thinking that we are to do the right things. How do we do the right things? By hanging out with the right friends. By listening to the right teachings, we've got to get under good preaching that will encourage us to do the things of what the Word of God says. There are many churches out there that they will give in to the itching ears. Oh, they'll, they'll tickle your funny bone. Oh, they'll say what you want to hear. You'll walk out and you've seen a good drama and you've heard a good fluffed up sermon. You feel pretty good about yourself. Oh, wretched sinner am I. It's not always about feeling good about myself. It's always feeling good about what Christ has done for me. Because the truth of the matter is, at the end of the day, I'm unworthy, but thank God He is worthy. It is not all about me, but it's all about Him. Get in right fellowship and get in the right book of God. Be sober so that we can fight against the things of the devil. But not only should we be sober, look what else he says. Be vigilant. The word vigilant, vigilant, the word vigilant means to be watchful. Be alert. So not only should we be sober, but we need to be alert. God, what can I do for your kingdom? How can I do that for your kingdom? The best way for us to be watchful, here it is, is to be prayerful. Always be prayerful. Not only that, would you look at verse 9? 
whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions that are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world be steadfast, standing firm, unwavering, standing strong to these things, that if I stand for Christ, I'm going to suffer. But that suffering as is if it will be. Because that suffering brings about a greater rejoicing. That's what he says in, in Matthew chapter 12. Tw- f- Matthew chapter... Good gravy, I can't speak tonight. Matthew chapter 5. And in Matthew chapter 5, when he gives us the command how to live, this is how I want you to live. By the way, if you live that way, you're going to suffer afflictions. You're going to suffer persecution. People are going to revile against you. The word revile means to uh, literally throw in your teeth. People are going to throw things up in your face. You're going to suffer just because you stand. But can I encourage you this morning? Stand. Stand. Stand on the truth of what the Word of God says. Why? Because there's a roaring lion out there. And he's awful loud. He's convinced an awful lot of people. Some of your kids he's convinced. He's convincing an awful lot of people. Some people sitting in this room that used to take a strong stance on some issues. Well, I don't know about that today. I don't know about that, Brother Joe. I'm talking to you. I'm preaching to you. If we were to go to Revelation chapter 5, you don't have to if you don't want to, but let's go over there just a second, and I want to look at verse 4. And I wept much. I wept much because of the things that I saw, John is saying. I wept much because the question had been asked of the angel, Who? Who is worthy to open the book that is sealed? It's not a run. Seems like that roaring lion and us being sober and being alert and being firm isn't enough. The roaring lion seems to have the victory, for there is none that is. So therefore I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me. So I kind of get in my mind, it may not be this way, but I get in my mind that John weeps, and the word weep means to cry out. It's not just, it's, it's, a, it's a bitter weeping, it's a loud wailing it's not just crying about something like a tear here, blue, blue. I mean, it's a, it's a cry out. And it's as if one of those elders stepped out of the line just a second and put their hand on his shoulder and said, hang on, hang on just a second. You're weeping for the wrong reasons. Look, and one of the elders saith unto me, weep not. Behold the what? The lion. Wait a minute. I thought our adversary was a lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, look here, hath prevailed. Enough said. Hashtag enough said. He's prevailed. Let that stick in your crawl just a minute. So if I was writing a psalm, I would say Selah. Because Selah means a pause in music to, for contemplation and thought. Open the book. And to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb. Wait a minute, I thought he was a lion. A lamb. As it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all of the earth. You know what John was seeing here? As John was thinking that there is anybody unworthy. Brother Joe, we're dealing with the uh, creation argument. We're dealing with the sexual argument. argument. We're dealing with the uh, tolerance argument, the theological argument. We're dealing with the alcohol. How in the world are we going to be able to combat against all this? How in the world are we going to be able to take strong? Even some of my dearest, closest buddies, it seems like they're uh, they're kind of waver on these issues. I'm the only one. It seems like me and my wife are the only spouses that stand against that. And Brother Joe, if we stand too much on that, we chase everybody else away. They start thinking that we're odd ducks and they start thinking that oh, we're the ones out uh, and, and we're not the ones that uh, really are tolerant as we should be. I, I understand that we may weep before God because it seems overwhelming and it seems too hard for us. But John saw uh, uh, the Lion of Judah. John saw uh, uh, the Lamb of God. Let me just remind you uh, uh, that there is a lot of roaring that's going on out there uh, uh, because our adversary is doing 
in it. Uh, uh, but there's going to be one final roar, uh, and it is Jesus Christ. Hey, uh, uh, Jesus uh, is going to have the last word one day uh, uh, when the trump of God sounds, uh, and I'm going to go to meet him in the air. Uh, hallelujah to the Lamb of God this morning. Amen. I'm sorry. Amen. amen. I'll preach it to the Methodists. They'll amen me better than you will. Do you know that a lion averagely lives out in the wild between 15 and 20 years? A lion can run up to 50 miles an hour. Not as fast as me, but that's pretty fast. He can weigh between 300 and 500 pounds. And he's known as the king of the jungle. Did you know that a lion will only fight another lion when it comes to the mating issue? And that's the only time. If it is not mating season, a lion doesn't bother with another lion. Now, they will all fuss and few with lionesses all the time. I <laughs> kind of like humans. <laughs> but they don't mess with their own kind. They say, and I'm not really sure how they know this because I don't think any doctor has ever been a lion, but they say that a lion recognizes another lion. And when he recognizes another lion, he recognizes that, li that lion probably has the same strength and the same authenticity and the same demeanor that he does. And so because of that, he just won't mess with them. Isn't that interesting? And so they just leave it alone. But you know, the devil is making an awful lot of noise now. By the way, can I say this? We make an awful lot of noise. Sometimes it's the wrong kind of noise. we got to get in the right kind of noise. The devil is a roaring lion, distracting and discouraging and demising, disrupting, doing whatever he can to disrupt the people of God. He's coming after you. But greater is the roar of the lion of Judah than the adversary. Why? Because he already has the victory. We don't live for victory. We live in victory because of Jesus Christ. And he had that final roar on the cross of Calvary when he defeated Satan and all of that transpires. And even though Satan thinks he may have one up on God, there is a roar that is louder than his roar. And that is the roar of what thus saith the word of God. And that's what keeps us keeping on. And that's what gives us strength to keep going. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. If God be for us, who can be against us this morning? That we got to listen that we got to hear the great roar of the Lion of Judah instead of the roar of that that's coming after us to bring great deception. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed this morning. Do you hear the roaring? What are you listening to? What are you dabbling in? Is it the wrong kind of roar? Or is it the roar of what saith? The Word of God. Father, I pray in these moments of invitation and reflection, I pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to use Your Word to bring about something supernatural. Father, there are some here this morning that are lost without You. They need to be saved. Dear God, there are some here that are struggling with where they stand on some issues. By way of the Holy Spirit, you'll move upon their heart. Lord, there are some that we've just called defeat. That we've chucked up our hands to our discouragement. And, ah, Brother Joe, I'm going to quit praying for my son or my daughter. He's just going to drink anyway. And I guess I'll leave it to it. I'm not going to pray for my grandkids because he's going to do what he's going to do anyway. But, Lord, that's not good enough. Father, you're much louder than the roar of our adversary. I pray that you will teach us to be sober, to be alert, and to stand firm. Thank you for what you're doing in this service and what you'll continue to do in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, friend. And God is speaking to you. As Brother Ron begins to sing in just a moment, if you need to come and pray, I invite you. Say, Brother Joe, if I go up there and pray, folks are going to think that I drink. It has nothing to do with it. Brother Joe, if I go up there, they're going to think I'm involved in pornography. you got to stop worrying about that stuff. If you need to come to an old morning bench and find exactly what yeah. you need, you'll find it in Jesus Christ. Amen. 
you're here this morning and you say, what are these folks all excited about when they talk about taking stands? It seems kind of intolerable to me. It seems like a wayward way of thinking. No, no. Hey, listen, we're not the odd ones out because we know the truth. Yes. We know exactly what God says. And the most satisfying life is under the umbrella of His authority. Amen. If you need to come tonight, this morning, I invite you to come. As we stand together, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Come on right now. God speaks to you as He begins to sing. Come. Hey, J.D. One, just as. Come, just as you I are. I am. Come on, friends. You're lost without God. You need to be saved. Come on. Why do you wait? Come. And Would you? Would you come just as you are? Broken and ashamed. And you may come and you say, Brother Joe, I've dabbled in things that you preached against. Where can I start? Start afresh and new by coming to God. There's still hope. There's still time. Come. Come. Hey, that lion is roaring to distract you, but come. To have the elders of the church come forward for anointing. Up one door. another verse come just as you are oh he loves you come Brother Joe to make his way to the vestibule. Do want the ushers to get the offering bags out. We will be taking a love offering for him as you leave. Uh, everything you give goes to support uh, his ministry today. A couple announcements. I uh, want to remind you that uh, today, youth competition dinner, spaghetti, salad, bread, dessert, and drink. Uh, $7 for adults, $3.50 for children, 12 and under. And if you're visiting, you eat for free. So we'd love for you to stay and uh, eat with us today. Tonight, after the evening service, we'll be honoring Bob and Gina Larkin. And uh, so, again, we want you to come back for that. Brother Jeff White will be preaching for us this evening. Uh, Going to have a good day, so uh, please come back this tonight. Um, in your bulletin is an announcement about the women's ministry is going to be meeting this Saturday on the, is it 14th or 15th? <laughs> this Saturday at 9 o'clock. We're going to be serving at the Life Care Network in Brandon. We need you to let Jody or myself know if you're planning on going so we can give them an exact number, but we haven't had anybody volunteer yet, so we would like to have some ladies decide to go and, and serve with them for a couple hours Saturday morning. Thanks. <laughs> 